My name is Christopher. I am a clinical educator for Vapotherm, but I am also a respiratory therapist. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today is no mask, no problem, high velocity nasal insufflation as an alternative to NIPPV or BiPAP is probably what you'll hear me refer to it as as we go throughout the presentation, okay? So just so you know, Vapotherm's high velocity nasal insufflation technology is a tool for treating the signs and symptoms of respiratory distress uh, in patients for whom prescribers desire to add heat and moisture to breathing gases. So we're going to learn, um, define high velocity nasal insufflation and the mechan mechanism of action. We're also going to describe the clinical outcomes with high velocity nasal insufflation technology. We're going to identify appropriate patients for this technology. And then we're also going to understand nursing care considerations for managing patients on high velocity nasal insufflation, which is huge because you're all nurses, right? So what is high velocity nasal insufflation? HVNI uses a unique high velocity gas flow characteristics from a nasal cannula with optimally conditioned respiratory gas to accomplish two objectives. Those two objectives being inhalation and exhalation. Um, for inhalation, we really want to meet or exceed the patient's inspiratory demand. So with high velocity nasal insufflation, we are able to do that. With the exhalation part, we want to provide adequate flow and flow velocity to purge the upper airway of uh, upper airway dead space of any CO2 that has accumulated during respiratory distress. Because we can all agree at the end of each breath, there's a little bit of CO2 that's left over. And we clear it just fine, but those people who have respiratory distress have a harder time clearing that anatomical dead space. And the anatomical dead space would be the nasopharyngeal airspace, all right? So this is a great animation that talks about and shows high velocity nasal insufflation. With HVNI, you will see that it creates these vortices within the nasopharyngeal airspace and flushes CO2 from that dead space through the nares and out the mouth as well too. And you'll notice that there's one little vortice in the back of the throat. And what that does is mimic purse-lip breathing. And what patient population do we know that loves to purse-lip breathe? Exactly, it's the OPDers, they love it. So the therapeutic goal of HVNI is to help manage the signs and symptoms of respiratory distress, including hypercapnia, hypoxemia, and dyspnea. Notice that hypoxemia is the second one listed in that. Really, HVNI is for those hypercapnic patients as well too, okay? We're gonna talk about ventilation efficacy. Minute ventilation is tidal volume times respiratory rate, which is your respiratory rate. And then alveolar ventilation is tidal volume minus that dead space times respiratory rate. If I take out the dead space part of alveolar ventilation, what am I affecting? Minute ventilation, respiratory rate. So effectively, I have flushed that dead space and now I'm going to affect someone's respiratory rate, right? So with this technology, it's able to support delivery of a high velocity flow via a small prong nasal cannula. That's important. It also creates and delivers optimally conditioned breathing gas to preserve mucosal function and aid in patient comfort. It also provides a precise FiO2 and flow to support a patient's oxygenation as well as ventilation needs. Clinical outcomes. So we're gonna talk about this type of patient that you've probably never seen in your hospital, <laughs> right? So you have a patient that comes in through the emergency room they are in the tripod position, they have increased work of breathing, they have bilateral wheezing and a wet cough. What would be the typical course of action that you would see in your hospital for this type of patient? Yeah, Lasix, you might put them on BiPAP with that Lasix, right? Which BiPAP has been the gold standard for so long, right? So you put them on BiPAP and what are they getting ready to do in this picture? Pull it off, yep, pull it off. So what we can say is, compared to intubation, BiPAP improved mortality, right? Because that was the other alternative to intubation for the longest time was BiPAP. It had greater patient comfort compared to intubation, 
and it reduced the cost of care. But with that standard of care comes complications, right? The patient might feel anxious about it, They're, they might have some claustrophobia, and then maybe some skin breakdown with that as well too. Because what are you telling your patient? It's fine, just breathe with it. You're in a tornado, it's totally fine, right? It's gonna help you. Or we're gonna put a tube down your throat. Like we've never heard that before, right? So how often do you fight with these patients? Yeah, many times, right? Especially on night shift. So if for some reason they are intolerant of BiPAP and the mask, what ends up happening is they be you sedate them, you intubate them, and then you move them to a more expensive care area. And I thought that this statistic was, was amazing. It comes from the British Journal of Anesthesia, and it showed that 33% of BiPAP failures are attributed to mask intolerance. It's huge, right? You don't tolerate the mask, you're gonna buy a tube. So I would like to present to you that high velocity nasal insufflation is a viable alternative to BiPAP. And this is a tool to manage the signs and symptoms associated with respiratory distress, including hypercapnia and hypoxemia and dyspnea. And it's delivered through a small bore nasal cannula. For the longest time, we only had a non-breather, BiPAP, and then intubation, right? Well now, high velocity nasal insufflation could be that bridge where you may never have the patient make it to BiPAP or CPAP and you don't intubate them. So that's a huge factor, right? That's huge. So we're gonna talk about this case study. It was a 60 year old patient who had a history of COPD and had been admitted 18 days prior before coming back to the emergency department at Athens Regional. The initial assessment noted tachypnea, nasal flaring, purse lip breathing, as well as bilateral wheezing and a wet cough. They decided to get a blood gas, and the pH showed 7.28, CO2 of 74, a PaO2 of 78, and a bicarb of 34. The physician actually ordered non-invasive ventilation, but it was never initiated. HVNI was initiated, and within 44 minutes, they noticed that the respiratory rate dropped, heart rate dropped and the pH went from 7.28 to 7.41. CO2 went from 74 to uh, 53. And of course their SpO2 went up because everything else was taken, was taken care of. Work of breathing was taken care of. So this is um, a randomized control trial that came from uh, Dr. Doshi. And he looked at five different hospitals throughout the country three community hospitals and two academic facilities. And what he decided, because it was randomized control trial, if you came through the emergency room, the envelope was ripped open and you were decided um, if you were going on HVNI or you were gonna be on BiPAP. And so what he discovered after 204 patients is that high velocity nasal insufflation is actually non-inferior to BiPAP. And he decided too that the other thing that this arm failure, this, this cause here, was because people were not as familiar with high velocity nasal insufflation. And so the crossover was allowed for them to go to BiPAP if they weren't comfortable with it. And he even said that that's why people decided to switch to BiPAP was because they were not comfortable with high velocity nasal insufflation. So 204 patients, and when you come in through the emergency room, the doctor typically doesn't know what kind of diagnosis you have. And this is a first study of its kind that looked at HVNI versus uh, BiPAP. And 46% of the patients had a hypercapnic component. And if you notice the graph here, this was high velocity nasal insufflations on the bottom in the blue, and then non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is the red at the top. What do you notice about that? Pretty, pretty in line, right? So that's the other thing that he noticed was that the outcomes, it, it wasn't any better, it wasn't even worse. He also looked at and asked the providers to rate high VNI technology. And he looked at patient response, patient comfort, and the simplicity of use. And high velocity nasal insufflation actually was higher in, in all three of these categories compared to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So patient selection, 
at least 50% of the nares have to remain unobstructed because we want that CO2 egress to happen through the nares. You have to have adequate flow and velocity to flush that dead space. And your patient has to be spontaneously breathing, which is also important, right? So therapeutic benefits helps reduce work of breathing, clear secretions and enables the patient to cough those secretions up because it is optimally heated and humidified. It is an active humidification process instead of a passive humidification process. Um, and it's safe and comfortable, it's a mask-free therapy, and you don't have to train the patient to breathe with it. You don't have to yell at them. So that's always a plus. Where can we use this? It has applications throughout the entire continuum of care. Emergency room being the big one, because if you stop it before it's, it, stop it in its tracks, then you can prevent them from going to ICU and then having them transfer to the floor. Cardiac ICUs, surgical ICUs, specialty ICUs for like vent weaning, trach patients, huge application. And palliative care is another area. I use um, high velocity nasal insufflation at my hospital and my aha moment was actually with a hospice patient because she was on BiPAP, the family was trying to talk to her, I was trying to talk to her, she was yelling it through the mask and I said this is ridiculous. And so I grabbed um, high velocity nasal insufflation and she was able to spend the last 24 hours of her life with family members talking and eating with them. So that was my, my aha moment. So there are integrated patient safety alarms and what's really nice is that it can actually plug into your nurse call system unlike any other high flow system on the market. Um, and they're not meant to be nuisance alarms. They're to identify that something is wrong with the patient, not the actual unit. The delivery tube is really safe for direct contact with skin. So in your world, they can totally lay it next to the patient because there's no heated wire circuits within it. Um, and what I always tell nurses is it's visually pleasing. <laughs> it looks very nice if you walk by the room. All right, large display. The cannula size matters. Um, with a small bore cannula, you wanna just make sure that you're not occluding more than 50% of the nares. The cannula flow path must be uh, open. So if you do have some boogers that develop because now they're all moistened, just clear it out and you're good to go. This is what the actual device looks like. It has three buttons. Alarm silence, control knob, run standby. So generally for flows for adults with high velocity nasal insufflation, you wanna be anywhere between 25 and 35 liters a minute. In the NICU world, you wanna be anywhere between four and eight liters a minute. And then for pediatric population, there is a Vapotherm app. It's free in the iPhone app store. You put in their weight, their age, and it generates a flow for you of where to start. The temperature to be adjusted, we want it between 35 and 37 degrees Celsius because 37 degrees is body temperature. Um, and you can also do that for patient comfort. Um, the transfer unit, which we have right here, um, you can use that to ambulate patients, get them up to the side of the bed, really big pulmonary rehab application as well too. Um, and then the water that's used is just sterile water because it creates that medical grade vapor, hence the name Vapotherm. It is very simple to use. You have three settings on the screen, liters per minute, FiO2, and temperature. It, again, very visually pleasing. So this is a great alternative to BiPAP because patients can talk, eat, and drink, and you can actually find out their history and, and what's going on with them. So in summary, high velocity nasal insufflation works by flushing out this anatomical dead space um, and provides a nice heated, humidified oxygen source. So we're basically taking a non-rebreather, flipping it in the nasopharyngeal airspace, and now the patient's breathing from a fresh gas source instead of rebreathing their own CO2. HVNI technology is a tool used to treat the signs and symptoms of respiratory distress. You can throw oxygen at a patient all day long, but until you address their work of breathing, you're not really gonna see a difference with that. And then of course, again, able to speak, eat, and communicate with the care team. Any questions?